Thank you very much, Ruth Martin. Um, it's a real pleasure to see you all uh, so early in the morning um, and to welcome you all to uh, CIFA on behalf of uh, the School of National and Public Affairs here at Columbia. I'm, I'm pleased to um, open the conference and to welcome you all. I want to just say a couple of words um, about, uh, about um, the enterprise that you're going to be engaged in today. And I should uh, apologize in advance that as soon as I say my uh, three minutes of, of stuff, I'm going to have to run. Um, uh, because, as Usman said, I'm, uh, I have administrative tasks, and with that, with my exalted title, come all kinds of meetings. Um, so I'll have to dash, but I'll be back later in the afternoon um, to uh, hear some about some of what you've uh, done during the day, and to chair a panel at, at the end of the afternoon. Um, but I think um, it's especially fitting um, and, and pleasing to me um, that this conference is being held at SEPA because it brings together a number of topics that are extremely important to, uh, to Columbia University, to the School of International and Public Affairs, and I think to the global study of public policy that we are engaged in here at the school. Um, the, the papers that you will be delivering, discussing, uh, and talking about over the course of the day um, deal with a number of the most pressing global policy challenges that, uh, that the world faces today. Um, the, the, the issue of migration, mass migration of people from one part of the world uh, to another, um, and the capacity of um, nation states uh, committed at least notionally to ideals of liberal democracy um, to absorb and to integrate um, and to make full citizens and full participants in society of people who come from different places, different parts of the world, um, and whose, uh, whose backgrounds, whose cultural uh, origins um, sometimes don't fit in as well as one might like into the host society. Um, that, as we know, is a, is a, has been a challenge for, for Western societies, for, for democratic societies, and, and, and indeed for societies all around the world for a long time, and it's become a particularly acute um, issue um, in recent decades. Um, and it's one that many countries, including the United States and France, almost um, uh, above all, uh, face now. Um, the question of Islam and its um, continuing encounter uh, with, uh, with the West, with Western societies, with, um, and particularly with the United States and France, um, is, is, a, is a topic that's taken on um, particular resonance in the policy world, in the global policy world of the last couple of uh, years, the last decade in particular. Um, and that encounter is something that needs um, clear-headed, focused uh, attention from, uh, from scholars, from policy experts, um, and, uh, and from all of us in the community. So I think that the, that the issues that you're dealing with are of tremendous importance. They're of tremendous importance to SEPA um, and to Columbia. Um, and uh, I know that having done some work myself on uh, the uh, comparisons of, um, of race and, and, and religion and, and integration policy in the United States and France, um, among other countries, um, that this is not an easy task. Um, it, but, uh, putting on my social science hat for a moment, it's an essential task. We need to understand um, both differences and similarities between these two countries and other countries. We need to understand um, what we can learn about the particular challenges that the United States faces, that France faces, that other uh, individual countries face in confronting these issues. And we also need to learn um, by juxtaposing different kinds of systems with uh, facing similar uh, challenges, we need to learn what we can understand at a more general level, at a more abstract level, at a more, um, at, at a, at a more cross-national level, um, about the challenges of, of integration and religion um, and migration uh, across, uh, across these countries. Um, so uh, I don't want to say much more, since I know you have a lot of work to do over the course of the day. So on behalf of the school and, um, and my boss, Dean John Crutzworth, I want to welcome you to SEPA. Um, I wish you a great day, and uh, I will be back uh, later in the afternoon to chair a panel, and I'll turn it back over to you. And France and two papers in the United States. The first panel, Muslims in the state. Muslims in the state. According to a 
study of Muslim integration in France, Britain, and Germany, comparing the state's attitude toward the accommodation of Muslim religious practices and teaching in public schools, public funding for Islamic schools, and the construction of mosques. Britain has been the most accommodating of Muslim religious rights, France the most hostile to them, and Germany in between. The main explanation for this, according to the authors, Joel Fetzer and Christopher Sopper, is pre-existing pre -existing state church relations. One set of questions raised in this panel is to what extent those relations affected the incorporation of Muslims in the United States and France. In other words, does France aggressive secularism make it less willing to accommodate Muslims than the United States, which is characterized by a more friendly separation between church and state, beside uh, Professor Stepan. This panel also examined the various fora in which uh, uh, state institutions and Muslim community leaders have engaged in order to negotiate the terms of Muslim cooperation. In the aftermath of September 11th, <coughs> Western states have waged war on Muslim extremists, the bad Muslims, but at the same time, they have endeavored to promote the good Muslims and, and or what has been uh, invariably called a liberal Islam, a progressive Islam, or a moderate Islam. In the process of bridge building between <coughs> their co-religionists and the host society, Muslim intellectuals have been in the forefront in rethinking Islam for the first 21st century, for the, for the 21st century. As will be argued by some panelists, they have emphasized the common Abrahamic heritage of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam to promote ecumenicalism, which they see as beneficial for Muslim integration. The question of a new jurisprudence for Muslim minorities in the West, in Arabic, fiqh al aqaliyat is at the heart of the question of Muslim integration. In arguing for a jurisprudence of minorities, for uh, Muslims living in the West. Taha Jabir al Alwani, a leading Muslim public intellectual and the chairman of the Fifth Council of North America, cites various reasons why the Islamic jurisprudence inherited from the old schools, the old madahib, um, is unsuitable for Muslim communities living in the West today. And I want to make a, a quotation, a citation of, of, uh, of, of Alwani. Open the code. Muslims, according to him, were not used to seeking ref refuge or justice in the non-Muslim lives. Citizenship, as the concept is understood today, was unknown. There were no established criteria for gaining citizenship in another country. The ancient world had no concept or experience of international law and diplomatic convention obliging host countries to protect migrants. The rationale of power reigned supreme Empires knew, knew, empires knew no frontiers, and their armies stopped advancing only when the terrain prevented them. Our predecessors did not experience the, in, the closely interconnected world we live, to, we live in today. The fiqh of conflict, that is the jurisprudence of conflict, was then prevalent, dictated by the time. But what is needed today is the jurisprudence of coexistence and I close the quote. So, uh, and why do you think that Muslim minorities can do better today without the fiqh, the jurisprudence born for a culture of conflict, and that the elaboration of a new fiqh, of a new jurisprudence, must not be an individual exercise of the Islamic jurist, as has been the case in the past. Rather, it requires input from experts in different disciplines of the modern social sciences who can work with religious jurists to elaborate a jurisprudence that is open to ishtihad, to reinterpretation and debate, and such, the, uh, uh, such jurisprudence uh, may even inspire the uh, majority. The endeavor to promote an Islam for the 21st century that is compatible with modern norms of tolerance, gender justice, and democracy is not just important for Muslim minorities. It has become central in the Muslim world, too, in response to the rise of uh, Islamism and its Extreme forms of Thus, the three developments that I mentioned earlier are uh, closely interrelated and have contributed to place the Islamic question at the center of international The second panel, Muslims and the public sphere, 
Uh, an important issue examined in this panel is the diversity and complexity of what has been called political Islam or Islamism. A few experts have argued that although Islamism was very appealing in the aftermath of the Islamic revolution in Iran, it had declined or failed uh, by the late 20th century. And notable among them are Sheikh Kebel in his uh, Jihad uh, Trail of Political Islam or Olivier Roy, uh, Failure of Political Islam. These are uh, two leading French Islamists. The trajectory of political Islam among Muslim communities in the United States and France is addressed by two papers in this panel that show that political Islam is neither monolithic, neither monolithic nor immutable. Alongside hardliners, there is a growing majority of Islamists offering a new understanding of uh, Islam. They have joined imams and other organic intellectuals to promote a new form of political engagement of Muslims in Western societies. Remarkable among them are the Muslim Brotherhood who pioneered Islamism, as I have said in my uh, earlier, and have, been, have become the most transnational Islamist movement and the trajectory of the Muslim Brotherhood in America and other Islamists in Europe is addressing this matter. Moderation and constructive engagement are one side of the story. The other side is criticism or withdrawal. Many intellectuals and imams have been critical of Western states' policies towards the Muslim world as well as their failure to accommodate Muslim needs at home. The search for Islamic scholarly credentials has been a way for some Muslim youth experiencing failure in school to rebuild their self-esteem. A number of them have been enrolling in new Islamic institutions of learning or joining study groups uh, created by Muslim activists to voice an Islamic position on most issues that their own society is facing or critique state failure to accommodate Muslim uh, needs. The third panel, gender and generational relations, the set of uh, questions raised in this panel is what happened to gender and generational relations after migration and settlement? Do immigrants succeed in reproducing homeland gender norms in their whole society? How does marriage outside the ethnic group affect inherited gender norms? The second set of questions deals with the transmission of identity to the next generation. A very old question that has haunted the first generation immigrants. The networks through which immigrant children are socialized within their ethnic groups and the actors entrusted with the responsibility to inculcate uh, gender norms are addressed in this panel. Paper presented here cover gender and generational issues among a variety of ethnic Muslims, including Turks, Arabs, and South Asians. The first and last panel raised ethnicity and citizenship. As already mentioned, a sizable second generation of Muslims is living in the United States and France now. Unlike their immigrant parents, most of these youth were born in and hold the nationality of their host countries. But as a few papers in this panel show, nationality does not always guarantee all citizenship rights. Race and religion can be reasons for exclusion and ostracism in both countries. Other questions raised are what extent residential segregation is an obstacle to integration? Are there similarities between residential segregation in French outer cities in all year and American inner cities? I hope that the importance of the themes and the breadth and interdisciplinarity of the papers discussed today will generate uh, questions and criticism that will help build a coherent framework of comparison of Muslim experience in the United States and France in the early uh, 21st century. And thanks again for attending uh, in this conference, and we hope that you will stay uh, all day. And without further ado, I will now turn the floor to Rebecca of the Migration Working Group, who will introduce uh, Professor Dan, the chair of the first panel. Thank you very much for your attention. Migration Working Group. I'm here to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Suleiman Bashir Dian, who is a professor in the Department of French and the Department of Philosophy here at Columbia University. His research, research is focused on the history of philosophy and logic, Islamic philosophy, and African philosophy and literature. He received his academic training in France. He was a former fellow at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, where he studied with Althusser and Derrida. And he received both his bachelor's and doctorate degrees at the University of Paris. 
Prior to teaching at Columbia, Professor Deanne was a vice dean and a professor in the philosophy department at the University of Dakar in Senegal, and he was also a professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Northwestern University. His many publications include uh, a study of George Poole's Algebra of Logic, a study of the Indian poet and philosopher Muhammad Iqbal, um, and his most recent publications include a study of Leopold Sengar and um, a book entitled Como Philosophy on Islam, which traces the development of Muslim philosophy. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Suleiman Bashindian. Thank you very much, Rebecca. <clears throat> but it's not about me, it's about this panel of scholars who are going to introduce us to the challenge represented by the integration of Islam in uh, Western uh, countries. As announced by uh, Usman Khan earlier, the topics are uh, those of uh, uh, this integration. And I just realized that all the panelists in some kind of military discipline have aligned themselves according to the order in which they are going to speak. So academia is infused with military spirit. We did not know. So, which means that our first speaker would be Ahmed Kuru on my extreme right. Ahmed Kuru uh, is someone we claim here at Columbia University, a wonderful scholar of Columbia University, who is now assistant professor of political science in uh, San Diego State University. And his topic will be secularism, state policies, and Muslims comparing France and the United States. So, it's good to be back at Colombia, and my work on comparative secularism has been deeply inspired by Professor Alfred Stephen, and I'm glad and honored by his presence in this panel. I wish there was a mirror for the panelists because. The entire presentation will be based on PowerPoint. You are going to miss it. So, when we talk about Muslims in France and United States, the first thing to do is to plug in the USB again. <laughs> is to look at the demography of Muslim population in both cases. And it's a contested issue because the number of Muslims in the United States, it's a very controversial thing. According to some public surveys, the ratio is very low. They give less than 0 0.6%. Okay. okay, so this is the title and then the demography. So some public surveys gives the number less than 2 million. And I put the range of 3 to 7 because President Obama in his speech in Cairo gave the number of 7 million. So he put it the very maximum level. And according to 3 to 7 million, it constitutes 1 to 2 percent. In France, it's almost the same, 4 to 5 million, but the percentage is much higher, 78 percent. If we look at some institutional data to understand the public visibility of these two populations. The number of mosques may seem higher in France, but it is directly linked to the fact that by mosque in France we mean sometimes very small spaces. And if you look at the percentages, 12% of all mosques in the United States has a very big size, more than 500, and some of them include 5,000 people, whereas in France only 4%. 
But did I so those who visit Paris on Friday prayer time may have anecdotal evidence to talk about the people praying on the street because of the lack of sufficient number of mosques. Whereas in the United States there are big mosques in different cities, but at least scientifically it's hard to document it. But if you look at two other criteria, the number of Islamic schools and the state policies toward Muslim headscarves in schools, there's a big difference. More than about 400 schools, 375 in the United States, and only three in France because of bureaucratic restrictions, because of the difficulty to fund the private schools in France. When it comes to Catholic schools, which constitute 20% of all students in France, their budgets, about 80% for many, comes from state funding. That's so far not, not the case for Islamic schools, therefore they have financial travelties. But in the United States, bureaucratic restrictions maybe are lower, therefore they, there are hundreds of the Islamic schools. And if you look at the legal status or the legal foundation, the Haskar ban and now the proposed Burqa ban are key issues in France, whereas we don't have such policies in the United States. Beyond this, Haskar ban and the number of Islamic schools, if you look at the American public sphere, there is a certain level of Muslim visibility. So you are seeing President Obama in, at White House in a Ramadan iftar dinner and, and then with a Haskar girl picturing. Then at the bottom you have the U.S. Post Service commemorating stamp for the Eid, the Muslim holidays. And then next to it you see a Muslim chaplain, namely, uh, his last name is Antep. And then he gave the opening prayer speech in the Congress last month. So this kind of public visibility of Islam is hard to see to be seen in the French public sphere. Why? Why are Muslims have the, the, the why do Muslims have more opportunities in the United States to express their religiosity? Why there are less restrictions in the American public sphere toward Muslims' public visibility? There are alternative explanations. One alternative is that Muslims in France constitute a higher proportion, seven to eight percent. Therefore, some policy makers, some public figures take them as a threat. They are so much concerned about it and try to restrict the potential threat. Is this so? If you look at the number of Muslim uh, girls wearing headscarf, which was a big debate in France from 1899 to 2004, they constitute less than 1,500. So, they were not a big threat in terms of number, negligible number. If you look at Muslims in France, whether they are pious, radical Islamists, or in terms of affiliation with Islam, they are not different from the French people. Why? Because the church attendance among Catholic French people are 10%, and mosque attendance of Muslim French 10% are the same. Very, very secularized people. In terms of Muslims in Europe, French Muslims seem to be the most secularized and less religious. Then, not a big threat from an Islamic perspective. And then maybe it's because of the fact that Muslims in the United States are much well represented in Congress, in the local political administration. Therefore, they lobby and they get, they get certain rights. Whereas in France, they are not well represented in politics. That's, that explains the difference between the two. Is this so? No. The answer is no. Why? Because if you look at Muslim descriptor of presentation, almost the same. Because in the United States there is no Muslim senator, only two Congress people in the House, zero governor, and only four state legislatures out of more than 7,000. And in France, two North African origin senators and zero deputy. So in both cases, because of the majoritarian electoral system, single district system, and also because of certain public concern about Muslim identities, Muslims are not well represented. And the representation doesn't explain the difference between the two cases. And then is this because of Islamophobia? What do we mean by Islamophobia? According to a British NGO, Rani Maid Trust, there are many components of Islamophobia. Islam is seen as monolithic, static, unchangeable, separate, 
other, it doesn't have values in common with the West. It's seen as inferior, barbaric, irrational, primitive, sexist, violent, aggressive, threatening, everything. So it's hard to believe all of them, but if you, you believe some of them, then here we can understand it. It, it. it has several components. So do we have this kind of perspectives in American or French public sphere or public level? The answer by and large, yes, because in the United States, according to public surveys, three groups have certain negative stereotypes, atheists, Mormons, and Muslims, right? And if people are asked whether they would vote for a president, an atheist president, a Mormon president, a Muslim president, the majority answer is no. If you look at the, the French public surveys, so definitely the concerns about Islam, or at least Islamism, is very deep in the French me memory, starting with Chanson de Roland, the 732 war between the Muslims and the Muslims from Spain, and the, the Battle of Tours, where the French army stopped the Muslim conqueror of Europe, going back to the colonial era, the colonization of Algeria, and then to the recent immigrant coming to France. And by 2002 elections, in the presidential election, the far right, Jean-Marie Le Pen's party, Front National, received 17% of votes. It would get even higher than the socialist, socialist prime minister, uh, uh, Jospin's 16%. And then it shows that there is a certain level of public concern about Muslims, one may call it Islamophobia, and there is very, very social scientific analysis to show that to have a Maghrebian name, a Muslim background, reduce your chance of finding a good job, even with the same CV of a French originated name, because of this public concern. So, does that explain the difference between the United States and France? The answer is no, why? Because in both countries you have Islamophobes groups. In the United States we have certain evangelical, <coughs> tele evangelical in the TVs, 700 clubs and others. And then what explains the difference? I would argue that the main factor that defines the two cases is the two types of ideologies, secular ideologies. In one case, in France, the dominant version of secularism is what I call assertive secularism according to which the state is supposed to play an assertive role. Whereas in the United States, the dominant version of secularism is passive secularism, in which the state is supposed to play a passive role. In assertive secularism, the state tries to exclude religion from public space and make it a private issue. Whereas in the pa passive secularism, under passive secularism, the state doesn't have such a social engineering project. It doesn't create a privatized religion. It just tolerates and accommodates public visibility of religion. But the countries are not monolithically passive or assertive secular. Instead, there are ongoing ideological struggles between groups in each of the two cases. So in the United States, the debate is between two types of passive secularism, or two interpretations of it. One is the separationist understanding of passive secularism, which requires a Jeffersonian wall of separation between church and state. And in the Supreme Court, the separationist judges were dominant from the 1940s until very recently. And very recently, accommodations gained five versus four majority with the junior Bush appointments. According to accommodationists, there shouldn't be a wall of separation. Certain entanglements between church and state are fine as long as the state does not favor one single religion at the expense of all others. So when you look at the separations versus accommodation debate in the United States, when I conduct the interviews with the representatives at the association level, I realize that both sides actually oppose a French type has scarf ban. Why? Because the disagreement between these two groups is about the establishment clause, whether a religion is established with public prayer, with a certain level of state recognition of religion, with Ten Commandments and other things. When it comes to individual religiosity, expression of religious faith, they have a certain level of agreement. 
And therefore, free exercise clause is not a big issue between them. And in the American legal system, based on passive secularism, a law cannot single out all religions or one single religion in terms of prohibiting religious symbols. Therefore, the French ban on all religious symbols is it doesn't have any legal basis in the United States because you cannot prohibit a symbol based on the mere fact that it is religious. You should have some very general concerns such as health, order, public order, or security. Even in the conditions where you have general reason for imposing a prohibition, religious groups in the United States may be exempt from the general ban. For example, the U.S. Department of State issued the principle that the pictures in the passport should be bare hat. You are not supposed to wear anything. But they say unless it's worn for religious purposes. Therefore, they put an exemption on it. So there are lists of cases, for example, the Amish case, where the Amish parents apply to the Supreme Court to be waived from the requirement of student attendance and then the court decided that based on their religious beliefs and practices the Amish society is exempt from sending their children to school after 8th grade. There is a recent debate though in the, Evers in, in the Smith case of 1990. It's a very important case to show the difference between U.S. and French understanding of secularism and legal principles. So one Native American with his white friend in Portland, they used Piote, which is a mild hallucinic drug. And ironically, they were working for a private anti-drug rehabilitation center. And then the center fired them for using drug. And then they say we use it for, as religious purposes. It was our religious ritual. Well, the one is not Native American. He said that I converted to Native American religion. And then the debate was that, according to the majority of the Supreme Court, it was fine for the Oregon state to put it in its state law that drug is prohibited unless you use it for religious purposes. But since the Oregon state didn't do it as 25 of, maybe more than half of the other states did, there is no constitutional exemption for the drug use. And then the minority in the Supreme Court said, no, even if the Oregon state didn't exempt it in the state law, still there is a constitutional protection of religious practices. Therefore, these gentlemen using Piotr in their religious ceremonies should not be fired. So, even at this level, the American legal system protects and supports religious symbols and practices, and it is impossible to think about singling out religious symbols. When it comes to the French case, the debate is between two types of secularism, passive and assertive, in the local language laïcité du combat, laïcité pluriel. So, and if we look at the understanding of secularism of the laïcité combat, very much assertive secularism, religion should be out of public sphere, and these two sides debated it for 15 years, and at the end, the combative secularism or assertive secularism, in my terminology, won the debate and then they pushed the ban and pass it in the parliament because they had about 70% of public support, whereas 30% of French public opposed the ban, 70% supported the ban. So then the next question, what makes, or, or let me, what makes the assertive secularists powerful? Because when it comes to the issues on Catholic schools, the public almost evenly divided, 50-50. But when it comes to Islam, the assertive secularists had a new ally, which is the Islamophobe right. So in the Hatskar debate, we see the emergence of a new coalition. So the two old enemies, the left and right wing enemies, come together, assertive secularists left and Islamophobe and anti-immigrant right, to ban Hatskar. Whereas the multiculturalist left and multiculturalist right came together to support a more liberal, new understanding of secularism, I would call passive secularism. And if you look at the discourses for the pro ban side, there are both Republican and feminist discourses. The public school should unify and homogenize, so these differences should be left out. The Haskar is a symbol of female submission and project cooperation. Whereas the anti ban coalition argued that it's 
the public schools should not tolerate, should tolerate diversity, should not discriminate. And the health care has multiple meanings. The parental or brotherhood oppression is not the only meaning of health care. So, then the question is why is assertive secularism dominant in France, whereas passive secularism is the dominant ideology in the United States? To explain it, I look at the historical origins and especially the presence or absence of an ancien regime. So the ancien regime refers to the existence of a monarchy and a hegemonic religion and the cooperation between the monarchy and hegemonic religion against the republican movement. And then when the republicans challenge and defeat the monarchy, they also target religious hegemony because they saw religious hegemony as an ally of the old regime, the monarchical regime. So in cases like France, Turkey, Mexico, Spain, Portugal, and Soviet Union, there was an ancien regime before the Republican era. Therefore, the Republicans were by and large anti-clerical. In countries that there was no Republican transition, the monarchy and hegemonic religions are new and contemporary. They are not ancient. In Saudi Arabia, they are still contemporary. But in the future, they, it may become an ancient regime. In some cases, no monarchy hegemonic religion, religion alliance like Iran, Ireland, and Poland. In some cases, no religious hegemony, Germany and Netherlands. And in the case of the United States, with some, some similar ex other examples, there was neither local monarchy nor hegemonic religion. There were multiple Protestant denominations with a kind of foreign crown, British crown, and then it didn't constitute an ancient regime. When I presented it, some people bring the issue of the British crown, crown plus England, uh, Church of England, Anglican Church. Actually, it really supports the idea of ancient regime. Why? Because since the Anglican Church supported the British monarchy during the colonial period, Right after the revolution, many of its th their priests were imprisoned or put in exile or left the country. They had changed the name of the church, and then many of the followers stopped going. And in all southern colonies, and then became states, Anglican Church was disestablished. So really, the, the local, the, the minimum example of ancient regime also worked in the American history. But in the larger picture, there was not a nationwide ancient regime. Therefore. Jefferson, Madison, and other founding fathers, I would call them rationalists, were not anti-clerical. And the evangelicals, like Isaac Bacon and some other Protestant leaders, were by and large open the idea of separation because if there were if there are twenty different denominations, your denomination's chance of being established is one out of twenty. And the other alternative that someone else denomination becomes established, 19 out of 20. Therefore, it is at this second best choice for you to see a church state separation in the, at the federal level than the state level. But in France, the Republicans and monarchies had a severe conflict, almost zero sum game, because the Catholic conservative supporting monarchy, they didn't want to see a separation because they want to keep the French Catholic establishment. Whereas the Republicans challenged both the monarchy and the Catholic establishment. Therefore, they pursued certain anti clerical reforms, especially in the Third Republic. So people generally emphasize the importance of the revolution of 1789, but from the Seventh Revolution to the Third Republic, many things changed, backs and forth always. But it was really the Third Republic which really coined and established secularism. From 1876 to 1906, you see the change of the numbers of the Catholic schools and the Catholic teachers and students in Catholic schools. And the sharp decline was not a simple result of societal demand and free market. No, it was a purposeful action by the Republican secularist governments and parliament. Certain laws they passed in 1901, 1904, and 1905, and they expelled certain Catholic school principals and teachers and and, and and try to eliminate Jesuits and some other Catholic groups and the result is the decline of Catholic influence in education and the rise of alternative public sector school system. So, if I summarize the whole argument in a few minutes, the presence or absence of the ancien regime in the French, the presence in the American example, the absence of the ancien regime, 
led to the dominance of assertive secularism in France and passive secularism in the United States. But obviously for the, the last two centuries, many things changed. In the United States, for example, secularism initially meant state neutrality towards all Protestant denominations, especially throughout the 19th century. There was kind of cultural semi-establishment of Protestantism. But by the Mikey trial in 1920s and then the prohibition in 1930s, it changed. Protestantism disestablished. But by 1950s, a new establishment emerged with monotheism, anti-communist, McCarthy era, then Eisenhower time, and then 1960s came the Supreme Court with the decision of prohibition of Bible reading and prayer in schools, also disestablished the monotheistic establishment. And now is the debate in the United States to integrate, so the Jews and Catholics integrated to socio-political system in the United States by 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and today, for example, if you look at the Supreme Court, Six judges are Catholics, two Jews, and only one Protestant, and he is 92 years old and will resign soon. We'll see what happens. But it really shows that Catholics and Jews really became the very much center of the socio-political system. And now the debate is integrating the atheists, the Muslims, and the Mormons. When it comes to France, yes, it was anti-Catholic in the Third Republic, but it was moderated, so the Vichy experience is the dramatical. But after that, with the Debra Law of 1959, the, the French state recognized and started to fund Catholic schools. And then there happened kind of equilibrium in France when it comes to Catholicism. And secularism is much more moderated. But when it comes to Islam, assertive seculars really remember their old anti-clerical times, and now they have a new allies, Islamophobes, the far right. And the combination of these two groups resulted in certain restrictions over Muslims such as Hatskarpen. So although the Hatskarpen was not Hatskarpen, it was the ban on religious symbols, but it really reminds the, the British saying that the law that prohibits sleeping on the bridge is equally applied to everyone, both rich and poor. The rich people are not sleeping under the bridge. So, 46 Muslims with headscarf and 36 are expelled as a result of the law, but zero Christian with cross or zero Jewish with kippah. And the combination of the dominant secularist ideology with certain cooperation or alliance and debates among the ideological groups led certain policies. And we see the result of more inclusionary policies in the United States, whereas more exclusionary policies in France. Thanks for your attention. I'm going to focus on some of the ways in which Muslims in the West, especially those in, in the US, try to undo exclusion. How do they integrate Islam? What are the discursive strategies that they employ in making Islam American, making Islam Western? So I have chosen two uh, themes that I will uh, highlight. Now the second generation and convert Muslims frequently distinguish between cultural Islam and true Islam, or more generally, between culture and religion. I always find this distinction to be a powerful discursive device. It allows them to dissociate what they consider pure Islam, or the essence of religion, from the cultural forms and practices associated with it. A religious Muslim woman criticizing the patriarchal practices of not-so-religious immigrant parents or a young imam ridiculing the Saudi Arabian policy of not allowing women to drive cars are just two examples. 
this imminent critique is not unique to American Muslims. Islam has crossed many cultural boundaries through such constant reinterpretation. And this is a point that most of the current calls for reform in Islam seems to miss. My research on Islam in America has shown me that context considerably skews the content. This, of course, is no news to students of sociology of knowledge or adherence to the constructionist view of reality. But here I would like to draw attention to something more specific. Islam is not rebuilt anew in America. It draws on the same vocabulary of Islamic images and symbols available everywhere. But it emphasizes different words of that vocabulary. Dormant concepts are revitalized, while some active elements may be put to sleep. This happens at an unconscious level, in response to the social and historical environment. Let me give you some examples. The figure of Abraham, who is unavoidably present in Muslim ritual practices, but doesn't occupy a central place in Muslim imagination or in Muslim self-perception, gains centrality in American Muslim culture. In a similar vein, many Muslims would say that the legacy of Muslim Spain doesn't necessarily represent the high point of Muslim religious history. For many Muslims, certainly the Orthodox, it can very well be seen as a period of degeneration. Not because Muslims do not value the pluralism and religious tolerance of that period, but because that dimension is not their main criteria. In Muslim contact zones, whether in America or elsewhere, such elements gain new relevance and importance. People draw parallels between the frontier cultures of Western Islam. Then it was Spain, now it is Europe and America. As if the Muslim owl of Andalusia had taken off from medieval times and landed in contemporary America. So a Muslim educational center in Virginia calls itself University of Cordoba. And a multimedia company, a subdivision of the Zaytuna Institute in California, is named Alhambra Productions. Muslim parents in America named their sons Ibrahim, Joseph, Adam, and their daughters Maryam and Sarah, but not Hagar or Hajar. So in my discussion today, I explore the two tropes of American Islam, where such appropriation happens. One of them is this new emphasis on Andalusia as both a precursor of Muslim identity in the West and a golden age of Muslim multiculturalism. And the other trope is the unprecedented emphasis on Abraham as a common ancestor of Islam and other Western religions. To proceed, I need to clarify a concept I used in the title of my presentation that is Western Islam. There is a phenomenon of Western Islam. It evolves out of interaction with the Western political and cultural environment. Thus, like any other articulations of Islam, it is historical. It suppresses certain elements of Islam and highlights others. For example, the notions of jihad or darul Har acquire new meanings or face marginalization. Western Islam is produced by Muslims in Europe and America. Here, of course, I'm not using a theological notion of Islam, but a sociological one. Regardless of the universality of its message, Islam inhabits various cultures and moments in time and styles of expression. Therefore, one can legitimately speak of American Islam or European Islam, as a lot of people do. It reflects the tastes, concerns, comforts, and anxieties of Muslims living in the West as religious minorities. I already mentioned the distinction between religion and culture. In this distinction, religion stands for an ahistorical pure religion, while culture refers to the historical and cultural forms it has taken in a given society, often deployed against the culturally incongruent elements in Muslim practices in America, it inserts a distance between religion and various cultures in Islam. Those cultures often happen to be those of Middle East, Africa, or South Asia. A Muslim community leader in Detroit once told me, many people mistake culture for religion. Take, for instance, in Saudi Arabia. Women don't drive cars. Well, 
did Allah say women can't drive cars or did Saudi men say that women can't drive cars? Such a distinction opens the possibility for new practices and new interpretations of religion without undermining the continuity and the integrity of Islam. In this search for the right form of Islam, Islam exhausts historical forms it has taken in different places and remains uncontaminated by the problematic aspects of specific cultures. So cultures are abandoned in the name of pure religion. And since religion can be found nowhere without a cultural form, this abandonment is ultimately done for the sake of you know, facilitating a institution and inhabitation of a new culture in its various forms. So you dissociate yourself from, let's say, Egyptian culture or Saudi culture, and you reassociate religion, pure Islam, within American uh, form. It settles in, in a new form. So in this emergent version or articulation of Islam, we see a strong interest and emphasis on Muslim Spain. Despite a very long temporal gap and cultural difference, why do Muslims in America tend to appropriate Muslim Spain as an exemplary era? My answer is because Muslim Spain offers Muslims in America and in Europe a set of identity-forming discursive tools. Such tools include History, which means Islam is not new. Familiarity, which means Muslims are not strangers. And acceptability, which means Islam is not undemocratic. Let me explain further what I mean. History, Muslim presence in the West is not limited to recent immigration. We are part of a European history and Western civilization. We were here, we are here, we belong here. That's the message that uh, the use of Muslim Spain uh, gives. The second one, familiarity, it says we are all children of Abraham. We have a history of coexistence and toleration. Muslim Spain offers this rare slice of history where three monotheistic religions live together in a considerable degree of peace and harmony. The Western civilization is not simply Judeo-Christian, it is Judeo-Christian, Islamic or Abrahamic. Acceptability, well, Islam is fully compatible with democracy. If contemporary Muslim countries suggest otherwise, it is because of their corruption. That's the message that this notion gives. Okay, it's not my, me preaching to you. So, the fact that Islam can be pluralistic and multicultural is proven by the historical example of Muslim Spain. Therefore, contemporary Western democracies should be pluralistic, pluralistic with respect to the Muslims in their midst and should offer them a seat around the multicultural table. The effort of reaching out to Andalusia or Muslim Spain is similar to earlier African American efforts to reach out to Ethiopia and the Ethiopian civilization. In this way, it injects history and cultural depth into the colonized and marginalized black identity in the case of African Americans. In the case of uh, more uh, children of immigrant second generation Muslims, Muslims go back to the Islamic Spain to give death, pluralism, and relevance to their Muslim identity in the Western context. So diachronically, we can say that the uses of Islamic Spain include insistent, insistence on Muslims' deep roots, frontier, continuity, and Western identity. And synchronically, Islamic Spain means pluralism, multiculturalism, and a notion of liberal Islam. So where do you find these tropes? Where do you find people talking about uh, Muslim Spain? Find it in public lectures by popular speakers, in convert narratives of self-identity, and in Muslim interfaith activities. A documentary film about the period of convivencia titled Cities of Light, the Rise and Fall of Islamic Spain, which aired in 2007, was one of the series was one of a series of recent public television offerings that portrayed Muslim culture to Americans in a strikingly positive light. Fundraising for the film became a cause célèbre among wealthier and more liberal American Muslims. Naturally, the film also drew considerable criticism from the usual anti-Muslim suspects. Now, the second trope is the notion of the idea of Abraham. 
interfaith activities are so central to the naturalization of Islam in America that the search for common ground inevitably leads to a new emphasis, a veritable discovery of both Abraham and Muslim Spain. They are respectively theological and historical links that Muslims believe have been forgotten and should be reclaimed. Muslim involvement in interfaith dialogue certainly has a longer history, but all activists I have spoken to agree that 9-11 had a tremendous impact on their level of engagement. There has been an explosion of ecumenical events since 9-11, and American Muslims are increasingly becoming visible on the ecumenical scene. Contemporary Muslim vocabulary draws heavily on the shared origin of the three monotheistic religions, and can be safely summarized as Abrahamic discourse. Such encounters, interfaith encounters, elevate one element of Muslim identity to a central position. The idea of Abraham as father of the three monotheistic religions. They share a faith with a common belief in God, prophets, revelation, a divinely mandated community, and moral responsibility. While Jews and Christians trace their lineage to, to Abraham through Isaac, Muslims do so through Ishmael. So, as visitors approach the entrance of the Unity Center, a rich suburban mosque in Detroit, the first thing they see is a rock inscribed with a verse from the Quran, and the verse is an explicit statement of Islam as an Abrahamic religion. You don't find anything of this nature in a Muslim-majority environment. The verse says, Say, we have believed in God and in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants, and in what was given to Moses and Jesus, and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and we are Muslims sub submitting to him. So that's the verse. Now, Muslims' emphasis on Abraham allows them to establish a relationship of kinship with the dominant religious identity in the U.S. And this is a claim to kinship. It's, it's not a pluralistic uh, demand for acceptance. It, it is almost a tribal uh, plea to uh, inclusion. And this is partly in response to, to nativism of 9-11 and so on. So it's partly a response to the uh, anti-Muslim sentiment and uh, political god talk. Now, as Muslims engage in interfaith dialogue, they step into the public square where there is a specific form into which every particular religion is hailed by American culture, and that form is American civil religion. Scholars of American culture have argued that American identity is no longer anchored in Christianity, but rather in a more generic theistic civil religion. This religion is characterized by belief in God, respect for difference, and the belief that religion is a matter of individual choice. <coughs> One way Muslim interfaith activists, consciously or not, make Islam an American religion is to adopt the ecumenical mode of speech. Islam is detached from its earlier forms, what we previously called cultural Islam. The process of pouring Islam into its new mold, its American form, gives rise to two kinds of ecumenism, two kinds of universalism. Externally, it neutralizes the differences between Islam and Judeo-Christian tradition. And internally, it undermines internal divisions along ethnic, racial, and sectarian lines. So in a sense, as Muslims engage in interfaith activities, they come to appreciate their own differences between Sunnis and Shias. Our college students call efforts to bring together Sunnis and Shias, they call it sushi. <laughs> So it has a more domestic internal benefit as they engage in, uh, uh, in efforts of the political activity. Now, the figure of Abraham, who doesn't occupy a center place in Muslim culture in their conventional settings, gains prominence in Muslim minority context. He is one of the few common threads, uh, threads through which Islam can enter the American or Western imagination and find a foothold of legitimacy. It is an attempt to erase differences in the public mind by assimilating Muslims into the category of fellow Abrahamic believer. I believe, I believe once Colin Powell uh, 
use the, this uh, phrase. Therefore, if the post-World War II discourse of Judeo-Christianity allowed the Christianization or normalization of Jews, Abrahamic discourse in the post-9-11 era responds to a comparable Muslim demand for Christianization or normalization via inclusion, kinship, and commonality of Muslims. My last now, in Western societies, Muslims are immigrant minorities and they face the challenge of articulating a profile of Islam, that is Western Islam, that is acceptable to the majority of societies. In the contact zones between Islam and Christianity, Muslims resort to various tropes of continuity. Here I have highlighted the two most important ones, the legacy of Muslim Spain and the discourse of Abraham. Both Muslim Spain and Abraham allow the second generation and convert Muslims in Euro-American societies to produce an Islam that legitimately feels at home in Western cultures. Thank you. And as a dual impetus of Muslim communities and the French authorities, as one of the principal embodiments of Islamic authority, particularly at the local level. The first part of my writing contribution summarizes the condition in which the social world of imams appeared in France. I present, uh, I present excuse me, from a sociological point of view, the chief states of their restructuring as immigrant workers of Muslim faith and how they became, along with their families, sedentarized in the French society. I also describe the principal facets of the Imam worlds. However, my, co my oral communication will focus on the second part of my article, a section dedicated to the study of the historical links between the French state and the Imams since the 1990s. I will focus on the recent years when the French states have taken the stool excuse me, has taken the issue of imams with the aim of influencing the definition of Islam. Fairly confidential for as long uh, as was managed by the Ministry of Immigrant Worker in the 1970s, this file gradually became more significant during the 1980s. The context of this state reflection was a public debate on the need to integrate immigrants which, in the case of the Muslim religions, <coughs> notably produces a discourse on the need to update Muslim worship in relation to those faiths with a longer history on French soil. However, so long as government only approaches the question of Islam through the means of correcting its material and symbolic, and symbolic indigence, lack of cultural center, absence of, of representation, absence of religious broadcast on public channels, etc., the inmate remains a secondary concern with little media attention. The situation changed radically from the early 1990s. Islam and Muslim worship was considered as a sensitive issue by French government advances because of a socio-historical -histor configuration marked by the civil conflict in Algeria. Indeed, in this context, agents of the Interior Ministry focused on the possible fallout in France from the rise of oppositional political Islam within the Arab and Muslim world, and particularly in North Africa. A first step of this increased focus was the development of the surveillance of Imam Salman. As a result, the question of Islam and Muslim worship is conceived from the perspective of, se of security by the French state apparatus, a security perspective which frequently appears in the Interior Ministry archive from the 1990s. Thus, starting with the second term of Pierre Jox as Interior Minister, this archive mentioned fundamentalist trait, I quote, claim to, the claim to be menacing France. In reference to this trait, the state, according to the counselor of the minister, should, on the one hand, follow the rise of, I quote, moderate tolerant Islam well integrated into French society, end quote, and on the other hand, I quote again, fight against the development of wild mosque with imam French fundamentalism, intolerance, and violence, end of quote. Emerging during Pierre Jacques tenure, this preoccupation became more marked during that of Charles Pasqua, who ordered the first surveillances of sites of Muslim worship. The surveillance again uh, increased again, excuse me, 
during Jean-Louis de Bouy mandate, following the wave of attacks, of terrorist attacks in France um, in 1995, uh, which culminated in the bombing of the RRB train in Paris. Indeed, the involvement of Khaled Kelkal in this act of violence, a young man born in Algeria but having grown up in the Lyon Po area, and who became Islamist in prison, reinforced the, the actions of the interior ministry suspicion towards the immigrants cleric represented by Imam in France. Through the generalization of surveillance of Imam Sermont, the agent of Renseignement Généraux, a state information service which has no US equivalent agency, are given the task by the entire ministry of identif identifying, excuse me, firstly, all attempt by the Imam to bring the Islamist political speeches and conflict into French oil, and secondly, any adherents of poor youth from so-called difficult urban neighborhood to send in form of religious radicalism. At the confluence of the logic of maintaining public order on the one hand, and on the other hand, the matrix of older debates around the integration of foreigners, Imam largely absent until then from the preoccupation of the agent of the, of the French state, burst into the field of the state's concern in the 1990s. A second step of this increased focus was the development for the question of Islam in of France and the appearance of a double matrix of a state discourse on Imams. Until the end of the 1980s, French, histories, French authorities accepted the fact that Muslim worship was essentially structured at the local level with the creation of the multitudes of Islamic associations largely independent from each other. In the subsequent decade, the development of oppositional Islamic Islam and its possible extension on French soil was interior minister to make the representation and organization of Muslim worship in France as a public problem requiring state intervention. Beyond the, the vicissitude of party politics, this way to rationalize the structure of French civil religion in public life, in public life justified by the need to favor the emergence of Islam à la Française, an expression behind which lie two distinct projects. The first, openly acknowledged, consists in guaranteeing religious equality in the country by improving the condition of Muslim worship in France and thus meet the legal definition of secularism. The second, less covered by the media and without doubt less recognized officially since it does not participate in the framework of secularism, aimed to circumscribe with the state apparatus a religion which, as we have seen, is a source of numerous concerns. Now, as attests the archive, the various attempt by the entire ministry to try to influence the creation of a central representative body for Muslim worship are also accompanied by the institutionalization of a public state discourse of Imam. As ambivalent figures, these men gradually come to represent for the upper echelon of Place Beauvau, either a problem supposedly posed by the Muslim religion in France or a possible diffusion method for more liberal Islam, modern and adapted to French society. Indeed, face of the foreign imam, presenting the note of various technical advisor in the interior ministry as, at best, the order of, I quote, outdated theological training, at worst, as having a, I quote again, marked Islamist tendency, and in all the cases, always incapable of speaking French and understanding the problem of youth French people who live in neighborhoods, the belief progressively emerged that the, I quote again, creation of imam would be undertaken so as to promote a French imam or, failing that, a francophone imam with trained friends. In other words, for the 1990s, imams progressively occupy a crucial place in the symbolic apparatus through which agents of the, state, of the French state define and plan to correct the, difficult, the, the supposedly difficulty posed by the Muslim religion in France. Indeed, as a drunker driver studied by Joseph Busfield with the chief explanation for world accident in the United States, the foreign imam, poorly integrated or fundamentalist, slowly become, in the discourse of French agents of the state, one of the case 
to explain the supposed dislocation of Islam for the value of the French Republic. Conversely, the French Imam, integrated, well trained, and moderate, become a positive agent of Muslim worship and the possible solution to this dislocation. Thus, will the former become to recurring protagonist of all the tales or anecdotes which supposedly prove the dysfunction of Muslim worship, the latter embodies the possibility of one day seeing an Islam à la française develop. Let me add that this belief does not only become widespread in the division of Place Beauvau and the corridor of Foreign Ministry and the Elysee Palace. Published by the declaration to the media of the minister and their representative, it also turned from the second half of 1990s to be heavily replicated in the French media, which transmit it to the public at large. This declaration slowly legitimized the idea that the responsibility that is the responsibility of agent of the interior ministry to influence the profile of minister of Muslim worship in France. <clears throat> However, before going further into the description of the mode of intervention of this state agent in the structuring of the imamate, I would be pertinent to stress that the action toward imam cannot be anything other than program of public action. Indeed, they are obliged to act indirectly in these domains because of the objective constraints of the legal and constitutional framework of secularism à la française. In France, secular secularism consists in a body of legal law which fix the legal framework, framework for state agent capacity to intervene, intervene uh, in the religious sphere. It defines the, na the nature of the relations the state can legally and legally hold with religious organization. Also, the French state does not officially recognize any religions. Some of its agents nevertheless find themselves in a position to regulate religious activity. For example, members of the Central Bureau of Religious Worship can oblige, through law governing association, religious institutions to conform to the general rules of organizations stipulated in the, 19, in the 1905 law of separation, separation of search and state. Also, members of the, of the police can, for their part, check that these organizations are not jeopardizing public order. But since the adoption of the law of the 1905, the French Republic is no longer legally authorized to interfere in the selection and nomination of Minister of Worship for the religion represented on its, on its territory. Agents, agents of the French state have had, at least in theory, no legal right to express an opinion on the fitness of a given individual to occupy such a role. Thus, to be apparent concordant with the legal frame, framework fixed by secularism, civil servant and political representatives are globally bound to act in an indirect manner through domain of public action in which the legal and political basis of state intervention cannot be questioned legally. Even through the legal rules of secularism for the entire minister and this ad advisor to act uh, directly on the recruitment of imam, they nevertheless devise at least three programs of public action which, in the course of the 1990s, aim to act indirectly on the profile of Minister of Muslim Worship. Not, noting that France, from the Muslim, war, uh, Muslim point of view, is a mission of country, that is a country that we say foreign missionary, the first apparatus for circumscribing imams in France consists in viewing the selection and profile of imam as a specific dimension of diplomatic relations with the countries of so-called Muslim immigration. In other words, the agent of Place Beauvau perceived the need to operate a bureaucratic rationalization of the situation of foreign imams by enrolling the consular networks of the country of countries of origin. Indeed, accepting that the role of imam be occupied by foreign nationals, leaders of the interior ministry try to favor those whose status as imam is officially guaranteed by the governments of their countries of origin. This first apparatus, little mediatized, is now in France as that of the Elko imam, 
referring to a program of bilateral cultural cooperation that already exists between France and the principal country of immigration and which is supposed to allow children of migrants to stay close to their parents' origin culture. It rests on the implicit idea that the candidates selected by will preach an Islam congruent with the interests of the governments in place in those states and the other side of the same coin will not facilitate the propagation of Islamism in France. Furthermore, supporting these consular procedures allows interior ministry agents to employ trusted diplomatic channels capable of keeping the imam concern in check or even ending residence in France in case of any problems. Indeed, consular imams are not only in a dependent situation from the financial and statutory point of view towards the diplomatic authorities of their origins countries, but they also find themselves during their stay in France, surrounded by hierarchical structures which, in the daily life and the events of problem, are potential interlocutors for, ag for agents of the French state. A second process, which goes back to November 1990, rests on the inception of the confidential proce procedure for monitoring visa application in support of the role of Minister of Muslim Worship. Indeed, in a country in which a major majority of Muslim clerics do not possess French nationality, the interior ministry systematically used the right to reside in France to try and officially to select good candidates to the imamate at the expense of bad ones. The second process resting on the exploitation of foreign rights to reside in the extension of the already longest French tradition of a la carte treatment, treatment of foreign through the frequent use of ad hoc circular. This measure, which only affects professional imam, also is the only impact on the fringe, fringes of the profile of imam in France, is not without symbolic usefulness for the entire ministry. Whether the petitioning imam are expected or obtain more or less temporary travel documents, each of the stages of the administrative investigation serves as a, remi uh, 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 as a reminder of, I quote, that to which a foreigner who infringes on the rule of good conduct expose himself. Secondly, this process contribu con contributes to facilitating the bureaucratic identification of foreign imams. This strategy has the immediate advantage for the state of facilitating the centralization of the body of information of which the various administration dispose on one imam and through so that to record and possibly to punish all deviant behavior or behavior suspected to be, be, to be deviant. At lastly, hello, uh, it lastly allowed agent, agent of the interior ministry to force upon foreign imam a certain reading of what the imamate should be in France in the sense that all individuals who agree to subject themselves to bureaucratic norms of identification participate indirectly in the symbolic acknowledgement of these norms. More mediatized than the first two, the third device conceived by agent, by agent of the interior ministry to try to influence the profile of imam officiating in French mosque to encourage and supervise projects intending to ensure the training of imam à la française. This last program is meant to create through the educational institutions that produce imam, imams a place where Islamic religious reasoning is adjusted to the fit the logic of the French state, formatting good practices and legitimate belief for future imams for the greater adaptation of the value of French society. However, the creation of institution, institutions uh, that have at the same time qualifying and certifying also more globally aims to influence the process through which the role of imam is established in France. Indeed, for the agent of the state promoting and directing the creation of training institutions for the profession of imam also stems for the desire to participate in the objectivation and definition of a right of entry into the internet. To make an educational institution the, the main means of accessing to the internet, it's also to progressively listen 
if not disqualify other, uh, other legitimizing avenue that those who wish to enter the human might, might take to improve themselves in a given mosque. However, most training projects, projects start or supposed, supported by the entire ministry struggle to launch and to function effectively. Indeed, the, the, project, the project started or encouraged by Plasbovo not only experience financial difficulties but also have problems to recruit to recruiting students as such training is generally viewed as an expensive investment in a profession that is currently poorly remunerated. While attempting to introduce official standards and certifications, the means of the apparatuses put in place by the Interior Ministry are confronted in practice with the question of the legitimacy built on the field by the imam the attempt to choose or certify. As both the archive I have consulted and my ethnographic, ethnographic research indicate, these public apparatuses fail to address the condition of emergence of a religious authority which, in the everyday, rests, rests, rests less an official titles and certification than one of the elective affinity forms in place of worship between an imam and those who over the time because is faithful. For in the absence of a single ecclesiastical institution or of a bureaucratization of the imamate like that put in place in certain origin countries of immigration, in France, an imam's audience remains the main barometer by which the religious legitimacy of a Muslim cleric is evaluated. Thus, that which the government cannot definitively rationalize is the success of chosen imams finding a place of the horizon of diverse expectations represented by the faithful of each mosque. Indeed, no title, no foreign state can guarantee the success of this cooptation whose form vary depending on the place of worship, but which determine, determine whether an imam succeed in establishing himself or in emerging within a mosque. Such a success with the complex processes of affinity which no bureaucracy can claim to master. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Solène Buono, and thank you all for, for uh, uh, papers that speak, obviously, to each other and speak to you as we be shown by our intervention. We have roughly 20 minutes of discussion. Oh yes, please go come and use this mic in this central alley for your comments and questions. Okay, my question is for uh, Malika. Uh, have you encountered uh, any definition by progressive Muslims? or liberal Islam, especially uh, major spokesmen like Khalid Abu al-Fadl, uh, addressing uh, major uh, issues like uh, how uh, the Muslim community sees itself in the uh, construction of the global order, uh, how the Muslim minority fits uh, in terms of uh, how it relates to the, uh, to the Muslim world and how what citizenship rights mean to them in terms of not just uh, uh, rights of defining Islam, but also in terms of uh, rights relating to the Muslim world and uh, demands they can uh, lay against uh, the state in which they live. Last, uh, last time I checked, Khalid Abu al-Fadl uh, published uh, uh, an article with Don Spicido and Bor Haddad's book, uh, Muslims on, on the Americanization Path, I didn't see him challenging this dichotomy of Dar al Harb, Dar al Islam. Actually, he was just trying to uh, produce it in, a, in an American, uh, in, an American uh, in, a, in a way that can make uh, sense to Americans. There is 
one part of this group that we be leaning towards discussing uh, citizenship rights and the relationship between the American Muslim communities and the Muslim world, and Khalid al is not part of that group. So what you have is, is I would say, a more left-leaning group within this progressive uh, trend that will discuss that very much. What do they say? And well, what they what they want is to, to of course, recognize the, the citizenship right. They want the citizenship rights to be recognized, right, in the West. And so they would militate in, in, for that, right? Khaled al doesn't seem to be interested in that. Khaled al has, has a much more academic and elitist view of uh, the definition of Islam. So uh, in a way, he's excluding all those who don't know about Islam to even you know, talk about it. He wouldn't say it this way so explicitly, but his discourse about fiqh and legal history is very clear on that. You know, there are people who know, like him, and there are people who don't. And obviously, the American mosques don't. <laughs> and so he's really putting himself in a very particular class of thinkers. Um, uh, but there is another trend within the, the liberal progressive uh, Muslim group that's much more attached to citizenship rights and would be less elitist in that sense. But there is a discomfort here. Uh, there is a discomfort. Who is who can speak about Islam? Who can speak for Islam? I mean, the, the, the question is not entirely solved, obviously. Uh, but that's a tension that continues to inhabit this whole uh, this whole uh, group of people. Yes. Thank you for this session, very rich session. I have two very short questions to, to Ahmed and Mujahid. First of all, Ahmed, uh, it was very rich and wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, but where did you find this figure of 10% of practice of Muslims in Europe? Uh, in France, because if I remember well, the EFOP survey 2007 shows approximately 25% of attendance for the, for the Friday prayer. So maybe this is five times of prayer, oh, oh, what is this, 10%? And from Jair, also a question, uh, I completely agree with this. Three discourse, you know, we are uh, from the same religion, Abrahamic religion, so no problem. Second, we are here since, uh, I don't know, 14th, 15th century, it is not new. And the third one, we are Democrats also, Muslims are kids with, with democracy. I think in France, I don't know if it is the case in the United States, in France, uh, since the creation of CFCM, the French Council of Muslim Cult, there is a fourth discourse from the Muslim elite, Muslim belonging elite, saying that Muslims are not only Muslims, do not see us only with our difference. We can be Muslims plus secular, Muslims plus atheist, etc., etc. I don't know if there is the same discourse of multi-belonging discourse in the among the Muslims of the United States. Thank you. Please, could you introduce yourself? Oh, Sam Martin from Southern University. Thanks, Sam, for the question. First of all, let me explain one point, which is that I do not make jokes in my presentation this time it was very serious because I still am the emphasis of jet lag. Just came from San Diego three hours ago. Still I'm tired. And you also seem to be a bit silly. Actually it was a joke because the real love is five percent. So anyway. <laughs> so zero point. Yeah actually uh, that's a good point so According to Liberation, uh, they have a special issue in December 8, 2004, which includes a specific data about the number of mosques and Muslim participation in mosques. They really gave the, uh, the number 5% in 2004, December 8, Liberation, Islam, Nationalisé. And I didn't trust 5% because women don't participate in Friday prayer. Therefore, Friday, Friday. Friday prayer, yeah. Therefore, I use 10%. Why? Because you, if you multiply 5 male with women and male, then 10. And then there are three other sources which are given 10 to 12%. One is the Debra Commission report. So the president of French parliament, Debra, similar to the Stasi Commission, had a commission about Hesker. And they gave it 10% in 2004. Then uh, John, Jonathan Lawrence and Justin Ways in Integrating Islam 2006, they gave 10 to 12 percent. 
And then Joab Clausen, The Islamic Challenge, it's another book, and I have the footnotes and, 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 and the page numbers, 10 to 12, so I'm surprised with 25, but you know public service change, but I have four different resources for one person. So the final point, can I say something to Mohammed's question about uh, the Dar al Harb Dar al Islam? I just reviewed for a journal Tariq Ramazan's recent book, and so far in his first three book, I didn't find very interesting things. The only interesting thing is the, his critique of Dal Hak Dar Islam, saying that just drop this terminology, it's outdated. We are just European citizens, and then we are not minority. We are, we are European citizens happen to be Muslim. And the recent book has full of interesting things we can discuss in the reception. That's a good segue to my answer to your question about sense of belonging in France versus uh, in the case of Christians in the US. I think uh, this notion of we are not minority, we are citizens. It's an anxiety that is more deeply felt in France, especially, but in Europe in general, because that belonging is much more fragile than, than it is in the US. So, uh, the reaction. Yeah. And my point was more specific in terms of the use of Muslim Islamic Spain as a legacy what it means, what are the benefits of having it. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, please introduce yourself for the call. I am Natalie Carpoy, I'm French and located, uh, currently based at the Politecnico of Milan. Uh, I have a question for uh, Solène Joanneau and uh, Ahmed Kourou, and I would like to have two answers, please. Um, <laughs> Um, Solène Joanneau focused her presentation on Imam, training of Imam, and especially new national policies regarding Imam. Uh, from your point of view, Solène, um, do we witness um, a more important assertive secular, secularism, um, taking the example of Imam? Is it, uh, um, a trend toward a more assertive secularism, or do we witness uh, the birth of um, a, a passive secularism? So, how do you how do you recall? What do you think? How do you estimate new national policies regarding imams? And so, if you think that it's a sign of assertive secularism, is it? Laïcité plurielle or laïcité de combat. To sum up, um, do we witness an hardening of the trend, assertive trend, or to the contrary, the birth of a new pattern in our country? Thank you. And also, I, I would like to have your opinion uh, to, yes, a, a dialogue with her uh, presentation. Yes. yes, so Salen first, then Ahmed, and Marika will have to uh, say something on that point. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to, to, to translate your answer. Uh, so Salen will be speak, answering in French, and uh, we'll try to convey what she says in English. Je suis désolée, je vais répondre en français parce que je serai plus clair qu'en anglais. Euh, J'avoue que très honnêtement, je ne me suis pas posé la question comme ça. Moi, le, le, la, la manière dont j'ai traité la question de, de la laïcité en France, c'est de dire, euh, un peu comme Gérard Montréal a traité la question de nation, c'est-à-dire de dire que la laïcité, c'est à la fois un ensemble de règles objectives, d'un point de vue juridique, donc on peut objectiver, euh, et puis c'est aussi euh, un ensemble de normes subjectives qui sont de l'ordre du... du de valeurs qui ont trait à l'histoire nationale française, au discours sur ce que serait supposément l'identité française. Et j'avoue que je m'en suis tenue là, parce que sinon la laïcité fonctionne pour moi comme un concept écran. C'est-à-dire qu'on ne parle plus de la laïcité, et je pense qu'il faut surtout s'intéresser à quelles sont les pratiques concrètes des agents de l'État par rapport à ça. Et moi, ce que j'ai pu montrer dans le cadre de ma thèse, c'est que euh, les agents de l'État français sont d'un côté euh, tenus par les lois laïques françaises, qui sont des obligations juridiques concrètes, 
Euh, et d'un autre côté, ils passent une partie de leur temps à essayer de les contourner quand elles les dérangent, à mettre en silence certaines parties de la loi ou au contraire en activer d'autres. Pour prendre un exemple de, 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 du caractère écran du Conseil de laïcité, pendant toutes les années 80, euh, les pouvoirs publics français ont expliqué le fait qu'ils n'intervenaient pas dans les affaires du culte musulman, et notamment dans le problème de manque de mosquées, etc., au nom de la laïcité française, en disant la laïcité nous empêche d'intervenir dans les affaires du culte musulman. Euh, depuis le début des années 90, c'est au nom de la laïcité que le ministère de l'Intérieur passe son temps à intervenir dans les affaires du culte musulman pour justifier le fait qu'il euh, faudrait faire exister un islam à la française et que donc il est de la responsabilité même de l'État d'intervenir. Voilà, donc à mon avis, on passe trop de temps à s'occuper de la notion de laïcité et pas assez de temps à travailler sur les pratiques effectives des agents de l'État français. Ok, so Solène explained that she did not actually uh, pose the question that way and uh, she defined, she made the distinction. In laïcité, you have on the one hand a set of legal rules and on the other hand it's also a set of subjective norms that are concerned with values connected with the history of France. And her main point is to say that laïcité, uh, the risk is that laïcité would sort of obfuscate the real questions that are the questions to be, to be posed, which are the practices, the actual practices of the civil service, everybody who serves uh, the, the, the French state. So, on the one hand, they have to respect the rules set by laïcité, the official uh, policy of laïcité, but at the same time, they, it happens that they have to ignore them. And she gave the example, the following example. In the 80s, uh, they were not intervening in the name of laïcité. They say we cannot intervene in everything having to do with uh, the cult because of laïcité. And in the 90s, it is in the name of that same laïcité that they intervene to establish the laïcité à la française. So, not too much emphasis on laïcité because it would obfuscate that kind of practice she is interested in. Thanks for the question, I think, very important. Because whenever I present a project on Turkey, France, United States, people ask me how, how would you define Turkey as a secular state despite the existence of the Anet? which controls 70,000 mosques and pay their imam salaries. But when, I, when I, I, I answer the question saying that actually it's directly related to the central notion of assertive secularism, that since the state is an agent of social engineering project to, to make religion something private, in certain cases like Turkey, where religious participation is very high, the state has the obligation to intervene according to assertive secularism, and therefore it tries to control Islam with controlling mosques and imams. It's part of assertive secularism. And if you look at the French example, in 1905, there were three proposals on the table before the passing of the law in Parliament. One was very marginal, extreme, by the free thinkers, liberal penseurs, et fond maçons. It was anti-religious. It was dropped. Then the, the two models. One was the control model that Turkey later adopted. That the comp and the comp the prime minister in 1904 defending the control model, saying that if we leave Catholic Church separated in its own, it will be too dangerous. You should keep it down under control. But then the second model was a separation model. Aristide Briand and then Jean Jaurès, and they if they won the game. And then French embraced the separationist type of assertive secularism, whereas later Turkey embraced the control model of assertive secularism. When it comes to Islam very recently, the role switched. Now French is imitating the Turkish model by the Hezkarpen, by the French Council of Muslims, the umbrella organization to control the mosques. And imams. So, in this regard, I find it very linked to the idea of assertive secularism. But I still want to give some credit to French practice, despite the ideology of assertive secularism, because of several reasons: the passive secularist challenge, or because of the democratic nature of the French politics and the practice. So, ideology is in the mind of policymakers, but the 
practice is always much more accommodating. And, for example, the Council of State in France, the Supreme Court of Administrative Affairs, published a report in which they are saying that Muslims are in a very disadvantaged position. And even Sarkozy sometimes articulate the same point. Because historically there were now about 40,000 Catholic church buildings in France, despite the fact that many of them are empty, people are not attending. And Muslims have a hard time to find any place to pray. I mentioned the streets are full of people on Fridays. Therefore they say, why don't we make some exemptions? exceptions in the 1905 law and give some money and at the mayor level now it is practice that some mayors providing money for most construction despite the separation idea of 1905 so in practice there's a mixture of assertive passive but definitely the idea is linked to assertive secular ideology thank you Ahmed. by the way you have also made the point that uh, Manika was going to make so for, uh, uh, thank you again. I'm an undergraduate at this university. Um, I'd like to focus on the idea of uh, incommensurability that uh, Professor Malika brought up in her talk. Um, so Mahmoud, when she writes about incommensurability, she uh, relates it to two things. One, Webb Keane's idea of semiotic ideology. So different relations with uh, materiality and uh, ideas, and even a different idea of religion, different from uh, the, the religion conceived by the assertive sort of secularism that uh, Professor Hoffman just talked about. My question is kind of extending this discourse of incommensurability, looking at it and relating it to notions of uh, assertive sort of secularism. And I was, it's kind of just an open question. Thank you. Um, well, what I was looking at is, is uh, exactly the opposite, how American uh, Muslim liberal intellectuals are trying to get into commensurability, right? Um, and, and in fact, what uh, I think uh, Solen and, and maybe Ahmed also pointed to is that what the state is trying to do is to reassert this commensurability for um, strategic aims, right? Uh, so the idea that there is incommensurability is not even on the table, or if there is, then it has to be ejected from the public space, right? Since um, whatever is incommensurable with the values of the republic, um, you know, has to be. Like the imams who are not the right the good imams have to be. So there is no even asking the question about, hmm, you know, uh, what about incommensurability can we even start thinking about? So I think the, the my point was not to think about the, the question of, of incommensurability of traditions, but rather to show how intellectuals were almost coerced after 9-11 to, <coughs> to bring things together, to make them converge and to, to, um, to fight for commensurability, whatever the price is, right? And so this created immense tension within the Muslim community, but also internal symbolic violence. Um, and so incommensurability was not to be discussed anymore because it was producing violence. Well, the 9-11 the attacks were, in a way, not even understandable because it was incommensurable with what is supposed to be the values of America. But of course, you know, violence is everywhere. And, um, so this is how I would respond. No, this is a very difficult question. The next session will be starting at 11.15, so you probably need the next seven minutes to sort of... Uh, yeah.